Gonzaga is reportedly in contact with Kentucky transfer wing Adu Thiero. Could he be the final piece to a championship caliber roster in Spokane? You are Locked On Zags, your daily podcast on the Gonzaga Bulldogs. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What is going on, y'all? Happy Wednesday and welcome into the Locked On Zags podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I am your host and longtime Gonzaga podcaster, Andy Patton, here to bring you news and updates on all things Zag athletics. we got a handful of topics to cover today on Locked On Zags. Former Zag target Trent Perry, a six foot four guard in the 2024 recruiting class. He has decommitted from USC after their coach Andy Enfield takes the job at SMU. Zags already involved in re-recruiting Perry. We'll talk about that. Also got some mailbag questions to answer to close out the show. But first, want to talk about a Gonzaga target in the transfer portal. And yes, we did a full episode earlier this week talking about Gonzaga's roster, talking about where they are at currently. It feels like they have a pretty solid eight-man rotation with the addition of Michael Ajayi. That does not mean that, A, Gonzaga will not continue to pursue players to add in the transfer portal, players they think they could help, players that maybe they, they identify as more of a long-term solution. You're going to continue to hear Gonzaga's name connected to transfers throughout the offseason, and we are going to talk about ones that we feel are relevant to discuss here on the Locked On Zags podcast. So I think that is why we're going to continue to talk about players like Adu Thiero, who who would provide a ton for Gonzaga. But the caveat is always going to be Gonzaga has a pretty full rotation, and unless somebody leaves, it is difficult to see a player transferring in and immediately filling a spot. So we're going to get to that. But first, we're going to talk a little bit about Adu Thiero specifically. He's a six foot six wing. Uh, he's from Leedsdale, Pennsylvania. He was a four star prospect who is ranked 14th overall in the 2022 recruiting class. That is at On3 Sports. Uh, he committed, of course, to John Calipari and Kentucky, and he didn't play much as a freshman. Calipari, you know, sometimes that happens. Even a guy who was top 15 in his recruiting class didn't get a lot of playing time on that 22-23 team that still had Oscar Shibwe and a handful of other very talented players. Uh, he played 20 games for Kentucky that year, averaged about 10 minutes a game, 2.3 points, two boards, and half a steal a game. But this past year, his role increased in part because of departures from players like Shibwe and, and others. And of course, because this team had some injuries early in the year, they had some ineffectiveness from guys like Justin Edwards, who didn't play as, as well as people had expected him to do for Kentucky. They had a lot of guys transfer out last year, like Severe Wheeler and CJ Frederick. So there was more playing time for Thiero to step into, and he really took advantage in a major way as a sophomore. He played 25 games for John Calipari's team, started 19 of them, played just about 21 and a half minutes per game, but he averaged 7.2 points, five boards, 1.1 assists, and 1.1 blocks. His field goal percentage on two-point shots was just under 53%. Uh, for the record, as a freshman, in a very small sample size, it was like 35%. So he dramatically increased as a shooter on two-point shots in particular. His three-point shot was only 32%, but that's also on less than one attempt per game. Not a three-point shooter. Doesn't mean he couldn't become a three-point shooter in Gonzaga's offense or Arizona's offense or another team that, that potentially pursuing him. But up to this point in his collegiate career, the three point shot, it's not even that it's been awful. It just hasn't been a part of his game up to this point. A guy shooting 32% on basically 20 attempts on the season doesn't really tell me in any way how good of a three point shooter he is. It's also worth acknowledging that Thierry is a very good free throw shooter, 80% this past year, which leads me to believe that the three point shot, if developed properly, could probably come around. The main draw for Thierro, though, is his defense and his athleticism. He is a big, strong-bodied wing. He is very athletic. He had very good rate defensive stats at Kentucky last year. Sixth best block rate in the entire SEC for a six-foot-six wing. Sixth best block rate. Now that factors in minutes per game. Obviously, guys had more blocks, total blocks than him. But in the minutes that he got, his rate of getting block shots, sixth in that entire conference. A good defensive conference, mind you, with teams like Tennessee uh, and other very good defensive teams. Florida was a good defensive team this past year. Uh, Kentucky, not so much. Alabama, not so much. Auburn, pretty solid on that end as well. Uh, 
he's also a very good rebounder, top 20 in offensive and defensive rebound rate. Again, five rebounds per game in about 21 and a half minutes for a six foot six guard in the SEC. Very productive rebounder. Uh, he also had his best games when Kentucky really needed him to. He had his literally two best scoring games of the season came against Kansas and Gonzaga. He had 16 points on, excuse me, 16 points and 13 rebounds on five of 10 shooting against Kansas. This was back in November. This was when Kentucky didn't have Zivana Miravisic. They didn't have Aaron Bradshaw. They didn't have a gun on So they were really shorthanded and they needed the air to step up and play more of a small ball four role. And he goes out and grabs 13 rebounds against a team that has Hunter Dickinson and KJ Adams. And at the time, a healthy, healthy Kevin McCuller. So really Really productive stuff from him in that game against Kansas. And then against Gonzaga, 15 points, five boards, three blocks, six of 11 shooting. He was a a standout player for Kentucky in that game that otherwise did not go well at all for John Calipari and the Cats, as all of you basically know. Uh, But Thierry was the guy who kind of stood out. So I think a lot of Gonzaga fans are going to have a positive perception of him because that was one of his better offensive output performances. And I mean, three blocks, a good defensive performance from him as well. You could see in that game how good of an athlete he is, how just his timing defensively was great. His athleticism, it all stood out in in a major way in that game. He also is kind of right now considered a potential 2025 draft pick. Now, lots of players are considered potential draft picks in April, uh, a year before, you know, 14 months before their actual draft rolls around. Many of them do not end up becoming draft picks. Uh, for those of you who do follow the draft or follow college, you know, coming into the college season, guys like Riley Kugel and Trey Alexander from Creighton, Kugel's at Florida, they were both considered like slam dunk. They're going to get drafted this year. Now, at this point, pretty un- Riley Kugel transferred to Kansas. He's not even going to enter the draft. And I don't think Trey Alexander is going to get drafted. So it certainly doesn't, just because the is getting labeled that now, doesn't necessarily mean that he's going to be a draft pick in 2025. But if that is his goal, which it probably is, if his goal is to transfer to a place where he will shine offensively and defensively and do enough on a big enough stage to get selected in the 2025 NBA draft, Gonzaga might be a tough fit for him. And they are far, far from the only school recruiting him right now. I'm going to read this list from Jeff Barzello of ESPN. He posted this on Twitter, indicating all the schools who have reached out to Thierro at this point. Gonzaga is among them, as well as Pitt, Miami, Arizona, Oregon, Ohio State, Indiana, Xavier, NC State, Arkansas, Texas A&M, Creighton, Richmond, Georgia, Santa Barbara, Penn State, Mizzou, DePaul, Georgetown, Ole Miss, and Duquesne. That's a big, big list of schools. Theo is from Pennsylvania, so if he wanted to be playing closer to home, which is not always something transfers want, but it is often something we see with players who transfer, that would probably put schools like Penn State or Pitt or Duquesne towards the top of this list. Now, if he wants to play in the NCAA tournament, only one of those teams made it last year. That was Duquesne, who wasn't expected to make it until they won the A-10. Now, Pitt is a program that had at-large aspirations and certainly could make the tournament with him in the fold next year. Penn State is a, a developing program with a new head coach, so we'll see kind of where, where they end up. But there's bigger roles available to him at some of these other big-name schools that aren't Gonzaga. Arizona stands out. Pella Larson, probably going to the NBA draft. Kishad Johnson, not going to be back. There's, we're not sure on Umar Bala yet, although he doesn't play the same position as Thierro. But if, if Pella Larson is not back, that opens up a starting spot at the three for Thierro. Creighton's going to lose Baylor Shireman. They have an open spot for Thierro, Thierro, excuse me, Thierro as well. Outside of that, NC State, most of their players are graduate transfers. They just went to the final four. We'll see if they can continue it past that and maybe even make a national championship game. If you want to go to a school that had that kind of success, has a ton of attention on the program right now, is in the ACC and has a a potential starting spot available for you, that would make sense as well. Uh, Arkansas is probably going to lose their whole team in the transfer portal. They're probably going to bring in a whole new team via the transfer portal. So they certainly stand out as an option for him if he wanted to stay in the SEC as well. NIL, of course, going to play a factor here as well. Now, in terms of the fit at Gonzaga, we kind of already touched on it already. It's hard to see. Now, Thierro defensively is fantastic. In in terms of, I I should say, his fit on the roster is great. He could play a 3-4 hybrid role. He'd be a really good defensive player. He could open up his game offensively. He would be a really good fit, especially if Gonzaga hadn't already added Michael Ajayi. But the fact that they brought in Ajayi, I just don't see a role for Thierro. Again, Nemhard and Hickman are going to start at the one and the two. 
I think Ajayi is going to start at the three. If not him, it'll be Steel Venters or Dusty Stromer. Ben Gregg's going to start at the four. Graham E.K. starts at the five. You have Braden Huff coming off the bench as well as Venters and Stromer. That's an eight-man rotation right there. Where does Thierro fit? I don't think he fits unless somebody leaves. I also don't think Gonzaga is going to secure a commitment from Thierro unless they already know that somebody's planning to leave. I don't think they're going to push somebody out. Now, I could be wrong about that. If the arrow is like gung-ho, dead set, I'm coming to Gonzaga, I want to play there as long as you give me 25 minutes a game, and Mark Few says, yep, bring him on, and then they lose Dusty or Steele or somebody else, that could happen. I would be very surprised. I want to be clear. I don't want to make it seem like I'm pre- predicting that to happen. I'm just saying it could happen. The more likely scenario is that the arrow wants to go somewhere where he plays big minutes right away, Mark Few doesn't promise him that, and he looks elsewhere. And unfortunately, that's probably going to be the conversation for a lot of transfers. And I say unfortunately, it's not necessarily a bad thing for Gonzaga. Mark Few and the staff should reach out to these players. They should go after the best talent they can in the transfer portal. They should be making those calls. But they also shouldn't be pushing people out, and they shouldn't be promising playing time that's not going to be there. And most of the players are going to respond to that by saying, I'd rather go somewhere where I can have more consistent playing time. And that's okay. It's okay if that pattern happens again and again and again and again this offseason because Gonzaga's got a dang good roster already. And if somebody wants to come into that mix and maybe not play a big role right away, but be prepared to play a bigger role the following year when Nemhard is out of eligibility, when Hickman's out of eligibility, when Greg is out of eligibility, that makes sense. And they might be able to strike gold by finding somebody who's willing to do that. Maybe it's the arrow. Maybe it's somebody else. Maybe they don't add anybody. But you don't find a a diamond in the rough like that, somebody who comes in and then bursts uh, onto the scene their second year, unless you reach out to everybody that you think is capable of filling that role on your team. The arrow fits that bill for Gonzaga. He makes sense as a future Zag. The arrow may not agree. He may not want to be that patient, and he may go somewhere else. That's the likely scenario here. But I want to highlight why I think these are important players to reach out to and important conversations to have, even if it's what it's likely going to result in from a fan perspective is a lot of tweets that have Gonzaga's name in them. A lot of players who are reportedly hearing from Gonzaga, considering Gonzaga, who ultimately don't end up coming to Gonzaga. That's probably going to happen a lot this offseason. The Arrow probably going to be on that list. But this is what that process looks like internally and why I think these conversations are valuable, even if they ultimately don't result in said player. I mean, Fierro could go somewhere else. He could go to Pitt, play at Pitt for a year, decide that's not for him, not be an NBA prospect, enter the transfer portal again, already have a connection to Gonzaga. By that point, they say, hey, Ajayi's gone, Greg's gone, we got a role for you. Boom, he transfers after that. If nothing else, this could be just laying a foundation to potentially make a a relationship or a connection that works for Gonzaga's benefit down the line. And actually, that kind of leads perfectly into our next conversation about Trent Perry. He is no longer committed to USC 2024 prospect. The four-star combo guard could end up in Spokane this fall because they'd already made that connection. We're going to talk more about that. After I tell you that today's episode of Locked on Zags is brought to you by Amazon Fire TV. Folks, Fire TV is your destination for sports, from live games to highlights to in-depth analysis. And Fire TV offers amazing viewing experiences with smart TVs, as well as the Fire TV stick that you can plug into your existing TV to provide access to millions of movies and TV episodes, as well as free and live TV. Whether it's March Madness or opening weekend for the MLB season, you're going to want to have yourself a Fire TV. We have Amazon Fire Sticks on literally every single TV in our house because we love the layout. We love the user experience. I love the remote because it even has little buttons that take you directly to Prime Video or Netflix or Disney Plus or Hulu. And Fire TV also recently created Fire TV channels, which deliver a constant supply of the latest videos from your favorite sports brands, including Locked On. You can go on there and watch all the Locked On podcast network content that your heart desires. They also have great news, entertainment, gaming, travel, and cooking videos as well. So check out Fire TV channels on Fire TV and Alexa devices. If you haven't done so yet, you should. Trust me on this. To learn more, visit Amazon.com slash Locked On Fire TV. All right, folks, segment two, still Andy Patton, still locked on Zags, and we're still talking about potential additions for the 2024-25 Gonzaga roster. We talked about a Duke Thiero transfer from Kentucky, his potential fit in Spokane, and we ended that conversation talking about how making these connections with players is a beneficial thing for Gonzaga and for any college program to do, even if it doesn't pay off right in the moment. 
And the perfect example of that here is Trent Perry. Trent Perry is a four-star guard from Harvard Westlake High School in Studio City, California. It's the same high school that Nick Kamenia, one of Gonzaga's top targets in the 2025 recruiting class, currently attends. Gonzaga got in late in the recruiting process of Trent Perry. He wasn't a player that Gonzaga had made an offer to until shortly before he ultimately committed to USC. And it felt like Gonzaga was kind of, yeah, like maybe they've been watching Kamenia. They finally decided, hey, this Perry kid's pretty good. Let's throw him an offer. Let's, let's meet with him, talk with him. And then Perry shortly after that, like I said, committed to USC. Now, USC fired their head coach. Well, USC's head coach went to SMU. It's unclear as of this recording whether USC was kind of pushing Andy Enfield out the door because of a disastrous season and he decided to take the job at SMU. Whether he voluntarily chose to leave and they were planning to keep him, I don't know. It doesn't matter. Andy Enfield, no longer the coach of the USC Trojans. Trent Perry, no longer committed to USC. But because Gonzaga had made that connection, they now have an easier path to potentially recruit him to come up to Spokane. And he said as much. Perry was recently, so the, the I'm recording this on Tuesday afternoon before the McDonald's All-American game. He is set to participate in the McDonald's All-American game. Uh, he was interviewed about it beforehand and, and his decision to decommit. And he basically said, I'm starting over with my commitment while like using the network and connections that I've already made. Gonzaga has already reached out to Perry again. It is he, he indicated as much that Gonzaga is one of the schools that has already contacted him since he decommitted from USC. So they were in on him late in the process when he committed to USC. They're in on him early in the process of his decommitment from USC. Gonzaga has landed decommitted players in the past. Nolan Hickman is a very notable example. A player who's committed to Kentucky, decommitted from Kentucky, ended up at Gonzaga, had a big role as a freshman and is now one of their best players. So it can absolutely happen. Perry is a six foot four point guard. He's 41st nationally in the 2024 class, according to on three sports. Uh, he averaged 18 and a half points, six boards, six assists, shot 47% from three as a high school senior at uh, Harvard Westlake. So very, very talented player. Uh, Perry acknowledged that the schools that have reached out to him since decommitting Gonzaga among them, as well as Alabama, Virginia, Nebraska, Stanford, and UCLA. He's also not ruling out a return to USC. He said he's anxious to see who USC hires. The rumor right now, as I'm recording this, is Eric Musselman is going to interview for the USC job, the Arkansas head coach, of course. Musselman, very, very good recruiter, very, very good uh, transfer portal navigator as well. If he gets the job, there's a decent chance he's going to find a way to be able to convince Perry to stay at USC, a team that's losing Bronny James, or lose, excuse me, losing Isaiah Collier, potentially losing Bronny James, Kobe Johnson already entered the transfer portal. So there's room for Perry uh, at USC. But the question is whether there's room for Perry at Gonzaga. Because while somebody like a Duthiero or other top tier transfer players may not consider Gonzaga without a promise of significant playing time, a freshman may be more willing to come to Gonzaga and wait it out. We are in an era where that is less common. And we'd be remiss to not acknowledge that the era of the transfer portal means a player can commit to a school, not play very much as a freshman instead of being like, well, I'll just wait my turn. I'll wait two years. I'll wait three years. They can just leave. So that is a difference. Gonzaga's built what they have built based on developing talent year over year. That is becoming a more difficult thing for them to do. Now they are great at navigating the transfer portal. So fortunately they are able to uh, kind of fix any issues on their roster that way. And also while we say, oh, this isn't happening as much, a simple look at Gonzaga's roster proves that is not true. Ben Gregg's development from year one to now is phenomenal. Anton Watson grew dramatically as a player from five years ago till now. Nolan Hickman's growth in the last three years has been tremendous. Braden Huff went from a player not playing as a redshirt freshman to being a huge piece for this team last year. So it is happening clearly in Spokane. And if Trent Perry buys into that, he could join this roster next year as the third point guard in competition with Luka Krinovich for that role. Perry and Luca would be nine and 10 in the rotation in my mind next year. Doesn't mean Perry wouldn't play. He would probably play pretty regularly. Just a lot of his minutes would be in garbage time. Whether he actually passes Krinovich on the depth chart would be an interesting thing to witness. His talent level puts him in a situation where he could potentially do that. Of course, Krinovich has a full year of development within Gonzaga's system, which help, gives him an advantage as well. But Nolan Hickman, he's in his final year. Ryan Nembhard's in his final year this upcoming season. So there are plenty of minutes to go around in the guard room. 
if I'm Mark Few and or Stephen Gentry or Brian Michelson, whoever's making the calls to Trent Perry, that's what you're selling. You're not selling freshman year minutes. You're selling sophomore year minutes. You're selling, you come to this program, you develop for a year, and you can be the starting point guard on the Gonzaga Bulldogs basketball team as a sophomore. How many of the last Gonzaga point guards have been in the NBA? Dang near all of them. It is a tremendous, tremendous growth development for Gonzaga point guards to be that player at this program. Now, Gonzaga is identifying some really great guards in the 2025 class, which might only help the cause. If I'm Gonzaga, I'm saying, Trent Perry, not only can you potentially be the starting point guard for this team as a sophomore, but you might be, you know, surrounded by Isaiah Harwell, you know, one of the best players in the entire country in his class. He might be your starter alongside you in that backcourt. A Perry Harwell backcourt could be incredible for Gonzaga. And that's what they need to sell Trent on. But ultimately, he has to make that decision. And he may look at USC or some of these other programs. Alabama's entire backcourt is graduating, although they did bring in Houston Millette from Pepperdine, who's probably going to start. Uh, He may look at programs like Stanford and UCLA, where they may have some more flexibility for playing time, even though they're not going to be as good as Gonzaga. And he may say, I want to go somewhere where I play right away. And these places offer that to me, whereas Gonzaga does not. And that's fine. If that's the decision he makes, that is very understandable. It's a big part of the reason Zoom Diallo did not come to Gonzaga as he reportedly wanted to play more than he was going to likely get at, at Gonzaga as a freshman. I think that's an understandable reason to not go somewhere. But I think Gonzaga is in a unique position to offer him something uh, really tantalizing, which is a big role as a sophomore for a program that is continually in the top 10, top 15, top 25 at minimum, and that is developing NBA talent. That is a tough tough thing to turn away. Obviously, NIL and various other factors are going to play a role here, but I'm not privy to what that looks like, so we're not really going to spend a lot of time commenting on it. But certainly, Gonzaga has something tantalizing to offer Trent Perry. And if he buys in, he could be a really great piece for this team. Maybe not as much next year, but certainly in the coming years after that. We're going to talk about Michael Ajayi's defense. We're also going to talk about Gonzaga's rim protection. All that discussed in today's mailbag episode. More coming up. After a word from today's sponsor, FanDuel, folks, the sports calendar is loaded and FanDuel is making it even more exciting to get in on the action because right now new customers get $200 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's $200 you can use to bet on the tournament, MLB, NBA, NHL, and so much more. Right now, Julian Strother and the Denver Nuggets, they have 350 odds, plus 350 odds, I should say, to repeat as NBA champions. I kind of feel like Denver's on a roll right now. That might be worth tossing some cash down there. If you agree, visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and make your first bet a big win. FanDuel, America's number one sports book. All right, folks, segment three, still Andy Patton, still locked on Zags, and we are looking at some mailbag questions here. We didn't do a mailbag on Monday just because we were recapping the Purdue loss. We were recapping the women's team losing to Texas. We were kind of getting ready into that off-season mode, but I grabbed a few of the questions that I did get submitted, threw them down here, um, hoping to do a mailbag again next week. So if you asked a question, you didn't see it answered here, I'll try to get to it next week. Uh, If you have a question that you want to answer, you want me to answer, of course, just shoot it to me on Discord, join our Discord channel. There's a channel there that you can just throw all your mailbag questions in. So uh, join that if you have not done so yet. Uh, First question here comes from Austin via Discord. Austin says, what a season with so many ups and downs. What was the highlight of the season for you? I picked six because, you know, that's what I do, but I'll give you the top three. Uh, Beating Kentucky, beating St. Mary's and Moraga, and the second half against Kansas. I think you can kind of go any direction there. Beating Kentucky was what finally put Gonzaga back in a position where they were on the right side of the NCAA tournament conversation. It's also beating Kentucky at Rupp Arena. How fun is that? John Calipari refused to play Gonzaga at the McCarthy Athletic Center. Mark Few said, fine, I will play you at your arena and I'll beat you in a down year. That was awesome. Beating St. Mary's in Moraga solidified Gonzaga in the NCAA tournament. I think beating San Francisco at the Chase Center probably solidified it as well, but it was like ironclad solidified when they beat St. Mary's in Moraga. That also ended St. Mary's' run at a perfect season, which is beautiful. Beating a rival at their home court, ending their perfect season, and putting yourself in the big dance, hard to get much better than that. But then that second half against Kansas, my goodness, what an absolute dominant performance from Mark Few's team in that game. It was one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen. A few other things I would throw out here. Uh, Watson's 35-point performance against UCLA was incredible. That game was hideously ugly, but Watson looked great. Uh, Braden Huff destroying it early in the year. That was a really, really fun thing to track and follow. Uh, The McNeese game, 
I mean, just dominance all around in their first ever five seed, 12 seed matchup for Gonzaga as a five seed. They went ahead and just crushed the team that they were playing. I'll toss out the USC game as well, simply because I was there with my dad and it was a really fun experience to watch that team live. Uh, that was my first time seeing them live that season. I also saw them a handful of other times after that, but uh, that game was incredibly fun for me personally. Probably not going to be on anybody's top five list necessarily, but a, a fun game nonetheless. Next question from Jeff. Via Gmail, Jeff says, does Gonzaga need to find a shot blocker in the transfer portal to stake a claim at being a top 10 team, or could Braden Huff develop into the type of rim protector Gonzaga needs? Uh, I don't think either. I don't think Gonzaga needs a, I don't think people are going to not vote Gonzaga as a top 10 team because they don't have a rim protector. I don't think it's going to happen. I think Gonzaga is going to be a top 10 team barring a very surprise off season that results in, in like multiple players leaving. If this roster that they have right now is the roster they go into October with, they're going to be a top 10 team almost guaranteed. Because the way AP voters vote in this modern era where rosters change so much is teams that have a lot of continuity that were good the previous year, especially good late in the year, are going to get a boost. Michigan State, great example of that. They weren't even very good last year, but yet they returned basically everybody. And then they uh, had a good run in the tournament and they got ranked fourth before the season started. Now, granted, they are not a great example because they underperformed. Hopefully that's not the case for Gonzaga, but Gonzaga is going to be a top 10 team next year unless they have a mass exodus of players on this roster, which I don't expect. I also don't expect Braden Huff to develop into a great rim protector. Most players, if you're not a great rim protector right away, you're capped at how good you're going to get. A lot of, of, of that kind of defense is, I don't want to say necess entirely instinctive, but it's hard. It's the growth potential there, I think, is somewhat limited. Braden Huff doesn't strike me as a player who's going to be a good rim protector. He's a great, great offensive player. I think he develops even better as a low post scorer. I think he develops as an outside shooter, and I think he gets dramatically better as a defensive player over the course of his career at Gonzaga. I don't think he's going to be your, your impact Brandon Clark, Chet Holmgren, Austin Day type rim protector. I'm not sure he's going to get anywhere close to that level, to be honest. I think he'll be a better defender long term than like a Drew Timmy, but I just don't think he he really he doesn't strike me as a rim protector, and I don't think that Gonzaga is counting on him to fill that role uh, necessarily. Next question, another one from Austin on Discord, who says, "You mentioned a lot about Jai on offense. How is he defensively?" It is very difficult to judge Michael Ajayi as a defensive player because Lorenzo Romar's defensive schemes are outrageously bad. Pepperdine is a horrible, horrible defensive team. And it is because in a large part of the scheme that they ran and not as much player personnel, it's made, it's hurt them even from like NBA draft perspectives. People really crapped all over Maxwell Lewis for his inability to defend in college. And I don't think a lot of that was his fault. Ajayi, his numbers, they're, they're not really there. It's hard to say. He's a great rebounder. He's a great athlete. I think he's got the capability to be a very good to at least above average defensive player in Gonzaga's system. Is he going to be Anton Watson? No, no. And he's not, he didn't get brought in here to do that, but he's, I think he's got the capability to be a good defensive player in Gonzaga's system, especially since he's committed so early, he's got a long time to learn it and kind of under, understand the ins and outs of it, but he's hard to judge now because judging his performance based on what happened at Pepperdine is, is misleading to say the least. Final question of the, of the show here comes from Jeff via Gmail. Jeff says, with Wazoo and St. Mary's in for potential significant rebuilding next year, what can we expect from the WCC? Can they still be a multi-bid league? My dude, it is April 3rd, and we are in the transfer portal era. I have no idea. <laughs> like, I don't know. Uh, and it's not because I don't know what's going on with those teams right now. It's because those teams are going to change so much. I mean, Washington State doesn't even have a coach. I have no idea what the roster is going to look like next year. They might be able to add, I mean, they might get a coach in, like maybe they get Chris Victor from Seattle U. Victor can bring one or two of the better players from Seattle U who aren't graduating over to Wazoo. He was able to navigate the portal successfully last year. One of their best players at, at Seattle U was a Creighton transfer. Maybe uh, Victor can bring in a couple other big transfers and keep Wazoo afloat. Maybe they hire David Riley from Eastern Washington and he does a similar thing. Maybe they hire an assistant coach who the players on the team don't like and they all leave and the team is decimated. I have, I have no idea. Honestly, in this era, it's just impossible to know 
what might happen. For St. Mary's, I'm not that concerned about St. Mary's. Losing Jefferson sucks. I mean, that really hurts for Randy Bennett's team. He is really talented, but they have three really good freshmen joining the program. I think that they're going to add some players in the portal. I know people are concerned about them because of an NIL perspective, but I think that Randy Bennett's going to find ways to, to, to pick the players that work for him. Uh, they've Randy Bennett has had success despite never having high profile recruits. I think he's going to continue to have success without having to navigate the transfer portal all that much. So I'm not worried about St. Mary's. They're going to be fine. I would be shocked if they fell below uh, like San Francisco and Santa Clara and those other teams in the conference. They, they just, they're Aiden Mahaney's going to be back. Augustus Marcelonis is expected to be back. As far as I know, they're losing Dukas. They're losing Mason Forbes. They're losing Joshua Jefferson, but Mitchell Saxon's going to be back again. Three good freshmen coming in. St. Mary's going to be fine. Wazoo's probably going to be fine. They're probably going to be a top five team in the conference, but they're they're the least uh, easy team to kind of gauge right now because they, like I said, don't even have a coach. So we'll have to see. The, ask me this question again in September. We'll have a much, much better answer then. It's going to wrap it up for us today here on the Locked On Zags podcast. Thank you so much. For those of you who have made this show your first listen or your first watch of the day, join us on the Discord channel if you have not done so yet. There is a link in the show notes on audio and video platforms. We're talking Gonzaga hoops, rumors, women's basketball, the baseball team, all that stuff 24-7 in there. Thanks again for listening. We'll be back on Thursday getting you ready with our start of our season in review series. Until then, as always, go Zags.